गुड इवनिंग वीरेशन ट्रावलिंग सर Oh, okay. Then we can start, no? Okay. Sir. What is the time? It's five, no? Five, sir. Ah, another. Ah, exact five. You can start. Yeah, yeah. Can we start, sir? I can't make it. Yeah, yeah. You can start. You can start. We can have later. Uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce our postgraduate from Barka. Uh, Barka is from Gandhi Medical College, student of uh, both Bangladesh and myself from Deepra Singh. and uh, i am very much elated because you have attained the big high uh, volumes of academic career and i hope you do the best and you serve the people and society and with this introduction i will hand over my responsibility to our academic chairman dr deepraj and uh, dr babu lakshmi thank you yes good evening good evening everyone uh, good evening uh, madam uh it is uh, as uh, dr veeresham has pointed out we are very happy to note that uh, one of my our post graduates has become attained such a height and uh, we are fortunate enough to have your lecture ma'am uh, dr bindu yes. hello hello good evening one and all uh, yeah, yeah. we are back to our pg teaching program today with the topic of fundamentals of neuroanesthesia and today we have here our uh, speaker dr barka bindu proud to say as sir has already mentioned that she is a student and uh, the academic contribution she has been doing is excellent she is be she is been a student of gandhi for mbbs and post graduation following which she finished her dnb and um, later she finished her dm in neuroanesthesia and critical care from aims delhi and she started working in medanta followed by uh, paras hospital where she is working right now and uh, she has uh, additional qualifications wherein she has done her uh, 
she finished her uh, Nissan EEG course and uh, she completed her neuro anesthesia intensive care update uh, 2021 conducted by University of Milano in 21 and uh, she has a certificate course in essentials of palliative care she is an instructor of uh, AHS uh, PLS and ACLS course and she got her professional diploma in clinical research in 2013 to her credit she has 23 publications and uh, she has written chapters in 11 books she has uh, another five four uh, publications that are in process for publication and she's been a reviewer to six generals which include um, neuro anesthesia and uh, medical journal of uh, armed force india she's been a faculty uh, to neuro anesthesia conferences and conducted seminars and workshops uh, she has paper presentations both in international conferences held at USA and UK and also at the national level. And she was awarded the best resident award at Ames New Delhi in 2016 and 17. And she also won a third prize for best poster presentation in 2020 at SNCC India. Uh, over to you, Barka. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, uh, the Asian sir. Thank you, the for for... Uh such an elaborate introduction. Uh, I'll start off with thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to uh, take this platform. It's always a very good feeling to be able to teach the students based from where you are yourself. So um, I'm Dr. Barkha. I'm working as a consultant in neuroanesthesia and critical care at Paris Hospital. And uh, the topic for today's presentation is uh, fundamentals of neuroanesthesia. So over the next uh, approximate one hour, I'll be talking about uh, neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, neuropharmacology, neuromonitoring techniques, and some specific neurosurgical considerations. Starting with the anatomy of the brain, uh, this is how our brain looks like. Uh, anatomically, it has been divided into two compartments, the supratentorial compartment and the infratentorial compartment. Now, the supratentorial compartment has two uh, several uh, hemispheres. Uh, each hemisphere has a frontal lobe, upper right lobe, inferior lobe, and an occipital. And the infratentorial compartment will have the uh, cerebellar hemispheres and the hemispheres. Thinking about the uh, functioning of each lobe of the brain, the frontal lobe is concerned with cognition, speed, and weight. The brighter lobe is concerned with the processing of uh, somatosensory sensations. The occipital lobe is uh, concerned with the uh, processing of visual stimuli. And the temporal lobe has a role in audition and perception. Brainstem, as we all know, is involved in uh, controlling vital functions of the body, and the cerebellum plays an important role in balance and weight. Now, apart from these nodes, there are two sulci uh, that are very important. The first one being the central cell. The central cell thus separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. The uh, portion that lies anterior to the central cell is called precentral virus, and this is the motor area of the brain. And the uh, uh, portion of the brain that lies posterior to the central cell is called the, called the postcentral virus, which is the Apart from this, there is this lateral sulcus that separates the frontal and the parietal nose from the brain. Apart from the lobes of the brain, there are a few other important uh, parts of the brain that you need to know. The most important being the hypothalamus. Thalamus and the hypothalamus have several nuclei. Uh, the hypothalamus has some important nuclei, which are the pre-optic nucleus, the supraoptic nucleus, the paraventricular nuclei. The important uh, functional aspects of the hypothalamus include endocrine control of the brain, uh, because it is involved in the secretion of several factors and several inhibitory factors, which play an important role in the functioning of the brain. Apart from this, the hypothalamus is involved in the secretion of some hormones like vesopressin and oxytocin. It is involved in autonomic control, temperature regulation of the body, very important water balance of the body, food intake regulation, maintaining the circadian rhythm, and emotion and behavior. Coming to the ventricular system of the brain, these ventricles are fluid filled cavities. Uh, uh, there are several such cavities located in different parts of the brain. You have two lateral ventricles, 
that are we have two natural ventricles that are connected to each other as the interventricular foramina or the foramen of uh, Monroe through which they communicate with the third ventricle. Uh, from the third ventricle, the CSF uh, flows via the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle, which continues downwards as the central canal of the spinal cord. Uh, some important things, the volume of CSF in a normal human adult is at about 150 ml, out of which 125 ml lies in the cranium and uh, 25 ml lies in the uh, spinal cord. On an average, about 400 to 600 ml of CSF is secreted every day, and uh, about four to five times the entire CSF volume of the body is removed every 24 hours. This is the vascular supply of the brain. This is the circle of villus, as we all know. The main blood supply to the brain comes from two main arteries: the uh, bilateral internal carotid arteries and two vertebral arteries. The internal carotid artery, once it enters into the cranial cavity, it ends by dividing into the middle cerebral artery or the MCA and the anterior cerebral artery or the ACA. Uh, I would like to stress on one thing here. Please note the direction of the MCA and the ACA. It's going to be important in the further discussions that we are uh, going to have further. Uh, now, both these two anterior cerebral arteries are con uh, connected to each other by the anterior communicating artery. And the uh, middle cerebral artery communicates with the posterior cerebral artery via the posterior communicating artery. The other important arteries are the vertebral arteries, which arise from the subclavian artery. At the lower end of the pons, the two vertebral arteries unite and form the basilar artery. Now, as the basilar artery ascends, it gives off pontine uh, arteries, which give blood supply to the pons of the brain cell. And at the upper end of the pons, this basilar artery again divides into the posterior cerebral artery, which then communicates via the posterior communicating artery. This here is the anterior spinal artery, which is involved in the uh, blood supply of the spinal cord. If we look at the cross section of the brain, from this figure, it is very clear that the majority of the superior and lateral aspects of the cerebral hemispheres are supplied by the middle cerebral artery, which is why this artery is one of the most important blood vessels of the brain. The medial part of the anterior portion of the brain is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery. The medial part of the posterior portion of the brain is supplied by the posterior cerebral artery. So, when there is a thrombosis of the ACA, it manifests as motor weakness of opposite limb. When there is a thrombosis of the MCA, it manifests as hemiplegia, entire hemiplegia of the opposite side along with loss of sensation. And when there is a thrombosis of the PCA, since the, uh, occipital load lies low, these the patients are present with visual symptoms. Uh, briefly about the venous drainage of the brain, it is uh, divided into superficial and deep venous systems. The superficial venous system involves the uh, superior sagittal sinus and the inferior sagittal sinus. The inferior sagittal sinus it combines with the great cerebral vein or the vein of gallium. These two unite here to form the straight sinus. So this is the uh, superficial venous system of the brain. The straight sinus, which continues as uh, the transverse sinus and the sigmoid sinus constitute the deep venous system of the brain. Now, the entire venous drainage of the brain drains via these sinuses into the internal jugular veins. Uh, this is just to show the number of vertebrae that we have. We have seven cervical, twelve dorsal, five lumbar, and five sacral vertebrae. Uh, briefly about the spinal cord pathways, I'll not go into the details. If uh, Assuming that this is the cross section of the spinal cord, uh, there is a central uh, 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 central canal in the center of the spinal cord through which the CSF flows. Now, this central canal is surrounded by gray matter, which is in the uh, shape of the letter H. So, we have on seeing, uh, if you see the cross section, you have uh, two. Two posterior horns, uh, two anterior horns, and in certain uh, portions of the spinal cord, you would also have two lateral horns. Because of these horns, okay, now this gray matter is surrounded by the white matter. Now, because of these horns, uh, the white matter of the spinal cord has uh, the ascending and the descending tracts, which, because of their location, are named as the uh, we have the ascending tracts, which are the sensory tracts. They are called the dorsal columns and they are involved in, uh, uh, in uh, carrying the sensations of deep touch, progressive and vibration. 
Then you have the latent spinal, uh, spinal thalamic tract, which is involved in conducting pain and temperature. And we have the ventral spinal thalamic tract, which is involved in conducting light bed sensations. Apart from this, we have the motor tracts or the descending tracts, which are divided into lateral corticospinal tract, involved in fine skilled motor activity, and the ventral, ventral corticospinal tract, which is involved in cross and posterior motor activity. Uh, about uh, neurophysiology, I'll start off with uh, mentioning the normal values, normal physiological values of the brain. As we know, brain is only 2% of the entire body weight, but it consumes 15 to 20% of cardiac output, it uses 20% of the entire oxygen consumption of the body, and 25% of entire glucose consumption. The normal ICP values, if measured in the horizontal position, in adults, it is 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury. In children, 3 to 7 millimeters of mercury. And in newborn children, 1.5 to 6 millimeters of mercury. Normal cerebral blood flow values are uh, 50 to 55 ml per 100 grams per minute. And if the cerebral blood flow go, goes to less than 20 ml per 100 grams per minute, it leads to cerebral and necrosis. Normal oxygen consumption of the brain is 156 micromoles per 100 grams per minute. Normal glucose utilization is 31 micromoles per 100 grams per minute. Now, why do we need to know about the importance of ICP? It is important because the entity called cerebral perfusion pressure, which ensures uh, that the uh, brain tissue is getting adequately perfused with blood oxygen and glucose. This is the difference of MAP and ICP, the difference of mean arterial pressure and intracranial pressure. So if the intracranial pressure rises, the CPP falls. And if the CPP falls, there can be ischemic injury to the brain. The other uh, reason why you need to know about ICP is that, as we saw, uh, the brain is divided into different compartments. The supratentorium and the infratentorium are separated from each other by the, uh, by the tentorium center. So, uh, the, there is a certain amount of pressure in each of the compartments of the brain. Now, for any reason, whether it, would, whether it is a tumor, it is a bleeding in the brain, it is hydrocephalus, for any reason, if the pressure in one compartment of the brain rises, it is the uh, normal response of the brain to uh, push the surrounding brain tissue into another compartment so that it can make space for the space occupying lesion, whatever it is. So that results in brain herniation. So there are different types of brain herniation. This figure is showing all the types of brain herniation. First one is subphalcine herniation. This is when there is midline shift of the cingulate virus under the fat cerebrate. Uh, this is easily visible even on the uh, CT scan. Then you have the uh, transtentorial or uncle herniation, where there is herniation of the uncle portion of the temporal lobe across the tentorium. This is where the tentorium severely lies. It separates the supratentorium from the infratentorium compartment. Then you have tonsillar herniation or transpraminal herniation, where the cerebellar tonsils herniate downwards through the coronal nerve. Then there is central or transtentorial herniation where there is downward displacement of the brainstem and diameter. And there is transcalvarian uh, herniation where, the, for example, if there is a space occupying lesion here, the brain on this side, the brain gets pushed against a defect in the skull. This figure, this graph, shows us the relationship between pressure and volume of ICP. So, uh, from this figure, we can make out that initially, uh, as the uh, intracranial volume is increasing, because the brain has high compliance and the compensatory mechanisms are intact, the ICP does not increase, which is uh, defined in books as state run, where there is no rise in ICP and the patient does not have symptoms. But gradually, as the intracranial volume keeps increasing, the compensatory uh, mechanisms are gradually getting depleted, the compliance is decreasing, and we can see the intracranial pressure begins. So there is a gradual rise in ICP, and common manifestations are drowsiness and headache. Now, here we can see as the intracranial uh, volume further increases, now because the compensatory mechanisms are completely uh, getting depleted, the compliance of the brain is very minimal. So we can appreciate here that for a small increase in intracranial volume, the ICP rises drastically. This is where there is a rapid rise in ICP and the patient will manifest with the cushion response. There is hypertension and bradycardia and there could be a falling consciousness. And if at this stage, no intervention is taken, 
then there will be collapse of cerebral microvascular nature, cerebral perfusion will cease, the patient will manifest with coma, fixed dilated pupils, and even health. Now, how does the ICP waveform look like? The upper figure shows the normal ICP waveform, that is, when the compliance of the brain is good. We have three waves in the normal ICP waveform. These waveforms you can see when you're actually measuring the ICP with the ICP monitoring device on the bedside monitor. So there are three waves, P1, P2, and P3. P1 is called the percussion wave, P2 is the dichrotic wave, and P3 is the percussion wave. When the compliance of the brain is good, you will see the height of P1 should be more than P2. As the compliance of the brain uh, reduces, as the compensatory mechanisms get exhausted, the height of P2 increases more than that of P1. You can see the, change in the shape of the ICP waveform changes. The factors affecting the cerebral blood flow, it is affected by uh, PaCO2, the carbon dioxide tension of blood. Uh, there is a direct relation between carbon dioxide tension and cerebral blood flow. So uh, with every millimeter mercury uh, of increase in PaCO2, the uh, cerebral blood flow increases by almost 3 to 6 percent and vice versa. PaO2 also, uh, if the PaO2 is less than 50 millimeters of mercury, there will be cerebral vasodilatation and the uh, cerebral blood flow and ICP remains. The other important factors affecting the cerebral blood flow are the mean arterial pressure, the cerebral metabolism rate of the brain, hematocrit. This is again important because if the blood is thick, that is when the hematocrit is high, hemoglobin levels are very high, the blood becomes viscous because of which the cerebral blood flow reduces. And if the blood is thin, that is hematocrit is less than 25 or hemoglobin less than 7 gram per cent, the uh, viscosity reduces of the cerebral blood flow increases. With age, there has been observed to be an inverse relation. As age increases, cerebral blood flow decreases. Temperature is another important factor that can affect your cerebral blood flow. Uh, it is observed that maximum reduction in cerebral blood flow is uh, occurring when the uh, body temperature is below 18 degrees. This is the reason why there have been several uh, hypothermia trials uh, regarding neuroprotection, the role of hypothermia in patients with traumatic brain injury. There have been several international trials, but nothing conclusive so far. And in fact, it has been shown that uh, probably uh, maintaining monothermia is the best way out at the most mild hypothermia. Then the various anesthetic agents, they can have uh, variable effects on cerebral blood flow. This we will look in detail when we do uh, when we see more. Briefly about cerebral autoregulation. Autoregulation is the capacity of the brain to maintain the constant cerebral perfusion pressure across, uh, maintain a constant cerebral blood flow across a wide range of cerebral perfusion. From the first figure, you can make out that in a normal adult brain, the uh, autoregulation limits are 50 to 150 millimeters. That is, as long as the CPP of the brain remains between 50 to 150, the brain is able to maintain a constant but below 50 and above 150 millimeters of mercury, the autoregulation is lost, and you need to take aggressive measures to actually maintain cerebral blood flow in the CPP when you're outside the CPP range. The second figure is showing uh, the changes that you see in a hypertensive individual. Uh, in hypertensives, the autoregulation curve is shifted to the right. So, where in a normal individual, it would have been 50 to 150, the limits of autoregulation in a hypertensive could be as high as 150. So this is important because uh, when you have an uncontrolled hyper, uh, hypertensive in your ICU or say in the OT, you have to be very careful about maintaining the CPP. You should not be trying to aggressively control and reduce his uh, blood pressure to normal levels uh, of 120 to 80 because at that blood pressure, his cerebral autoregulation is not working. You have actually reduced the blood pressure and you are actually reducing the cerebral blood flow, which will be if you have brain metabolism, under normal conditions, when the oxygenation is normal, glucose supply is normal, the brain uses glycolysis and the PCA cycle to generate ATP. When there is hypoxia, the brain uh, enters into anaerobic glycolysis, where, as we know, the ATP generation is much lesser compared to uh, normal uh, uh, glycolysis and PCA cycle. And in fact, with anaerobic glycolysis, there is production of lactate and H plus ions, which cause further injury to the cell. When there is hypoglycemia, the brain uh, generally uses only glucose for its uh, uh, energy supply. 
But when there is hypoglycemia, the glycogen stores that are there in the liver or in the fat are utilized. And once these glycogen stores are used up, the brain tends to utilize ketone body. These ketone bodies are not used by the brain under normal conditions. It is only then uh, in situations of hypoglycemia that the body is used. Uh, just one slide about neuropharmacology without going into much details. Uh, we all need to remember some very important things when we are giving anesthesia to an injured brain. <clears throat> this table shows the various volatile anesthetic agents. Across all the volatile anesthetic agents, you will see that the facility increases, 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 and the burst with nitrous oxide. So you will see when you are giving <clears throat> anesthesia to neurosurgical patients, we very rarely use nitrous oxide. And uh, xenon is one of the newer agents that has been shown in experimental studies to reduce uh, ICP. However, because of its cost constraints, constraints, it is not uh, available right now. Then the IV anesthetic agents, terpentone sodium, propofol, etomidate, all of them reduce ICP, except for ketamine, which increases ICP. Now, here one uh, recent um, change or recent development that I would like to mention is ketamine was earlier aggressively uh, uh, it was aggressively said that ketamine should not be used in neurosurgical therapy. But now the latest data shows that yes, it does increase the ICP. But if you uh, but if you uh, take in other corrective measures like hyperventilation and a few other things, you can actually control the rise in ICP that is occurring because of ketamine. Index metatomidin is another agent that reduces ICP. Uh, about the epileptogenic potential of these anesthetic agents, this is also important because a lot of neurosurgical patients come for uh, uh, epilepsy surgeries wherein you should know which agent can actually cause seizures in problem. Ticofluorine and nitrous oxide are epileptogenic, ketomidate and ketamine are epileptogenic, and the opioids, all of them are epileptogenic. Dex metatomidin also can cause seizures. And about the ability to cause cross blood brain barrier, none of the uh, all of the anesthetic agents cause cross blood brain barrier except for our muscle glands. Coming to neuromonitoring, um, neurosurgical patients, they uh, all the other standard monitoring techniques that you would uh, apply to a normal uh, surgical patient have to be applied to this patient. But apart from that. Um, I will be going uh, a little heading wise to show you the uh, recent developments and some of the specific things that we do in neurosurgical anesthesia. So, there are different parameters that you would want to monitor in a neurosurgical One is the cerebral blood flow, then you have to monitor the uh, you want to monitor the cerebral metabolism, and you want to monitor the depth of anesthesia. So, how to monitor cerebral blood flow? This is not very relevant. Uh, as of now, in the intraoperative period, but this is more important uh, in the postoperative period. So, this is the instrument that we use for uh, most commonly used instrument for monitoring cerebral blood flow. It's called the transcranial buckler. This is what the machine looks like. We have a, a monitor screen, we have a mouse, and we have a handheld remote. Uh, and these are all the windows through which we try to insulate different red vessels of the brain. So this transcranial Doppler machine, this utilizes a 2 megahertz probe, which uh, and it tries to measure the flow velocity of blood in different blood vessels of the circular fluids. But before I go into the details of this, I would like you to uh, keep that picture of circular fluids in your mind. Uh, just uh, the way we saw at the anterior uh, portion of the brain, we had the internal therapy that dividing into the MC and into the AC. And in the posterior portion of the brain, we have the vertebral lab was dividing into two basin So now, these are the four windows through which uh, you can insulate circular uh, The most commonly used window is the transtemporal window. This is just about a zygomatic uh, process because here the thickness of the brain is uh, less compared to the rest of the portions of the skin. So this is the transtemporal window. Then the other windows that can be used are the transorbital window, the uh, submandibular window, and these. Uh, suboccipital or the transplanar. The suboccipital window is used for insulating vertebral and basal arteries. Uh, now, <clears throat> so when you uh, insulate, yeah, it takes uh, a lot of practice to actually get the vessel that you want to uh, see. But this is how the uh, screen looks like 
once you get the result. So this is the middle cerebral artery. This is what the flow would look like on your ECG screen. Now here you can see the graphs are upward. That means when I'm insulating from here, if the flow of blood in the circle of hemisphere is towards the toe, the graph will be upward. You can assume the flow of blood in the MCO, MCA is towards the toe. Now the ACA was going this way. So the blood flow would be away from the toe. That is why your graph is inverted here. Now this is what the uh, normal flow velocities look like uh, with the MCA and the ACA. Now how to identify the vessel? Because there are a lot of vessels in this uh, circle of pillars. There could be a lot of blood vessels in which the flow is towards your probe. There could be a lot of blood vessels in which the flow would be away from the probe. So how to identify which vessel you are insulating? That, uh, that you will get an idea from the depth at which you are getting the insulation. This graph here shows the depth at which you are getting the insulation. I'm not going into the details of this. You can find these things in any standard you the anesthesia principle. Uh, and this is what the blood uh, flow velocity looks like when there is basis as most commonly seen in patients of aneurysmal SH. You can see uh, the peaking of the waves here. Now, general flow velocities also are different according to the vessel, but uh, for MCA, it is usually said that if the blood flow velocity is more than 120 centimeters per second, then it is indicative of this. Now, coming to EEG. EEG also helps us uh, give us some idea about the uh, status of cerebral blood flow. Uh, there are four different wave forms in EEG, as we all know. The EEG becomes abnormal when the cerebral blood flow reduces to less than 20 ml per 100 grams per minute. In routine use, EEG is nowadays being used to identify seizures in the neurocritical care unit. It can be used intraoperatively in patients undergoing corrective impact therapy, where uh, uh, you can make out changes on the EEG when there is interaction of blood flow. Then it is used for uh, patients with SAH to detect vasospasm and very importantly it can be used for providing cerebral protection wherein your target is to reach an isolated region. So the next monitoring technique is evoke potentials, a very vast topic in itself. I am uh, going to present in it just uh, slides. There are two types of evoke potentials, sensory evoke potentials and motor evoke potentials. These evoke potentials are actually uh, monitoring the electrical activity in different neural pathways after you're giving an external stimulus. So the sensory evoke potentials are monitoring your sensory pathways, motor evoke potentials are monitoring the motor pathways. Now there are three types of sensory evoke potentials that we uh, commonly use. Somatosensory evoke potentials, which are actually monitoring the posterior columns of the spinal cord. As we discussed, these are the uh, sensory pathways of the spinal cord. Then there is the brainstem auditory evoke potentials, which monitor your auditory pathways, and the visual evoke potentials, which monitor your um, visual pathways. Then the motor evoke potentials can be of two types, depending on the kind of stimulus that we are giving. It could be electrical or magnetic. Briefly about uh, different, uh, uh, just the salient points of all these uh, monitoring techniques. The somatosensory evoke potentials, the nerves that are commonly used for stimulation are the median nerve, alna nerve, or the posterior nerve. Um, there are a lot of details about these monitoring techniques. What uh, amount of amplitude you use, what amount of uh, voltage you use, how many stimuli you have to give. I'm not going into all those details. Plus the uh, salient points that the SSCPs are sensitive to anesthetic agents, so you have to be very cautious about what anesthetic agent you are using. Broadly, I would say uh, avoid inhalation agents. Uh, go for TIVA. If TIVA is not sufficing, you can add inhalation agent at less than point. Apart from that, they are very sensitive to temperature changes. Hypothermia can result in abortion of the SSCP. You have to be careful about the hemodynamics and hypoxia also will reduce your SSCP. So this is uh, when uh, the, these monitoring techniques are done by a neurophysiologist. And uh, when they would say, when they would inform the surgeon that there is a change in SSCP, these are the criteria. The waveforms, if there is a prolongation of latency by more than 10% or a decrease in amplitude of less than 50. The SSCP potentials are nowadays very commonly used for spine surgeries, for tumor surgeries, and for central aspects. Pains to moderate work potential are resistant to anesthetic agents. And it is commonly used for uh, brainstem and uh, CP angle tumor surgeries, for uh, posterior surgeries, and for posterior circulation, vascular uh, surgery. 
Then we have the motor reward potentials. These are also affected by anesthetic agents and they're commonly used along with somatosensory reward potential, uh, especially for spine tumors, for tumor surgeries, and for motor cortex mapping. So important things about uh, NVP monitoring are that uh, the uh, electrical current that has to be given to get a response of NVP is very high. Very high voltages are delivered to the patient using two pins that are attached to the uh, skull. Because of this very high electrical current that is uh, given, uh, there are two, three important things that are um, practically important in the intraoperative period. One, the patient can the patient in total tends to move on the uh, OT table. Second, uh, because uh, the uh, electrical current used is very high, they, they, you need to put in a mouth cap, the patient's mouth, which we commonly call as gulla. That is because the, uh, when there is movement of the patient, there is a very high uh, likelihood that the patient will uh, injure on his tongue, there could be teeth injury, get into this. Now, ICP monitoring, we have invasive and non invasive techniques of uh, ICP monitoring. Uh, invasive techniques include uh, fluid filled external pressure transducers. This is the uh, same technique that we use for invasive blood pressure or CPP monitoring. Then we have the Corbin catheter, which is commonly available. There are some newer techniques also nowadays, which is the fiber optic uh, uh, technology utilizing the Magno transducer, and you have the Spielberg ICP system. The non invasive methods of monitoring ICP are tympanic membrane displacement, transcranial Doppler, and optic nerve sheath pad. This is what the Corbin catheter looks like. This is the catheter that is inserted via a bulb hole into the patient's pain by the surgeon, <coughs> and this is attached to the monitor, which uh, shows you the readings over here. And this is the ONSD, wherein you do an ultrasound uh, by placing your probe over the eye, and you have to take the uh, diameter of the optic nerve sheet three millimeters behind the nerve. The value of ONSD more than six millimeters is indicative of high NSD. Now coming to depth of anesthesia. Uh, I think this everybody knows we can use different techniques by spectral index, spectral entropy, apportionment. This figure I'm including here just to show one thing that uh, this is one of the kind of uh, newer monitors that is available now, which shows apart from QCAN, QCON, it also shows QNOX, which is the um, uh, status of an IV6 status. Then we have cerebral oxygenation monitoring techniques. We have the jugular venous oximeter. This is uh, just like the central venous catheter. The only thing is that the central venous catheter goes downwards, this goes upward. And once the catheter is inserted, uh, the aim is that the tip of the catheter should reach your jugular bulb. So uh, this can be confirmed by either doing a CRM uh, uh, X-ray of the uh, skull and neck, or you can get in, uh, get a proper uh, X-ray done. So the ideal position uh, would be the tip of the catheter should lie Cranial to C1, C2 interspace, or it should lie slightly cranial to the line joining the two mass members. Now, this jugular venous oximeter measures oxygen saturation of venous blood at jugular brain. As we discussed in the venous drainage of the brain, the entire venous drainage of the brain comes into the internal jugular. So, when you're measuring oxygen saturation at jugular bulb, it is representing your global oxygen extraction of cerebral tissue. The drawback with this technique is it does not give you any idea if you have a focal pathology. It will only let you know about the global oxygen status of the brain. Normal values are 60 to 75 percent. There is a right to left difference of about 5 to 50. It is said to be low when, it, when the value is less than 50 percent. This can happen when either your oxygen supply is reduced or your demand is increased. It is said to be high when it is more than 75 percent, which can happen if your oxygen supply is high or your demand is less. Uh, one important thing, if you're getting a value, uh, if you're getting a value of more than ninety percent, that means that oxygen is being supplied to the brain, but the brain is not utilizing any of it. This is happening when you have brain death. So, value of more than ninety percent is usually indicative of brain death. Can you have near infrared spectroscopy? Uh, this is in the form of two sensors which are applied uh, to the forehead of the patient. Uh, each sensor on each side of the midline of the forehead, slightly above the uh, eyebrows, because this is where your sinuses come, and we do not want the venous blood in the sinuses to contaminate your values of NIRS. 
So this gives values in the form of RSO2 uh, values. Again, a non-invasive uh, technique, the normal values I've shown here. There is a right to left difference of about uh, 10%. The cutoff values that are indicative of cerebral ischemia are value, if the value is less than 40 to 45 percent or if there is a fall of 20 to 25 percent from baseline. Now, brain tissue oxygen monitoring, PBTO2 uh, values, uh, these are not very commonly used. These are again uh, measuring focal oxygen tension in the brain's interstitial space. Normal value is 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury. It is said to be compromised when it is uh, less than or equal to 20 millimeters of mercury and it is indicative of hypoxic injury of the brain if it is less than 15 millimeters of mercury. But there are a few other monitoring techniques like microdialysis, which are of more of research nature. Uh, hence, I'm not mentioning it in my presentation. Coming to positioning in neurosurgery, again, very, again, uh, very important because neurosurgical uh, patients have to be put in very strange positions in the OT. So this is the path bench position. I'm not uh, showing you the normal positions like uh, supine and the uh, lateral positions, which I think all of you must already be aware of those positions. Only the specific uh, positions that are used in neurosurgery is the path bench position. But this is what it looks like. This is your uh, uh, Mayfield head holder. These are the uh, lateral supports that you give. And this is the pillow is here for supporting the lower limbs. So this is what the final uh, position of the patient uh, looks like. This hand, though not very clear in this figure, this hand will be uh, hanging down from here. So this hand will actually be free. So any position that you give in neurosurgery, you have to be very careful about uh, pressure padding, about uh, giving adequate padding to your pressure points. This is a uh, uh, different uh, ways of uh, prone positioning. The, this is the horseshoe that we commonly used. This is the Wilson frame. And these are the bolsters. And this is one of the newer uh, head pillows that is available nowadays. This is what the final position looks after after, after placing the patient in prone. Sitting position uh, nowadays not very commonly used, though some uh, uh, some neurosurgeons still prefer to use the sitting position, usually uh, used for uh, posterior posterior surgeries. So this is uh, the head holder, the Mayfield uh, frame here. So in the, this will be coming from the front. One main difference. In other positions, uh, it comes from here, but here it will be coming from the front. And um, some uh, other important things like uh, the you have to keep the hands on the uh, patient's uh, stomach. Uh, some important uh, complications associated with the position, one of the important ones being the uh, venous air embolism, for which you have to use a transesophageal echocardiography intraoperatively. It is available in places where you uh, are doing sitting positions. These are the commonly used uh, head frames nowadays. Uh, use the horseshoe frame, and this is the main field. Uh, frame. It has got three pins, two on this side and one would be on this side. Earlier, there was a four uh, pin frame that was used, it was called a sujita. And these are the prone position frames. This is the Ritten Hall frame, the patient would lie over here. This is the Wilson frame on which the patient lies. Then uh, these are the uh, head supports that they commonly used and uh, commonly used in prone, prone position. This is the newer pillow that is available nowadays. So um, the patient's forehead would lie here. And there's nose and mouth lying here, and this is from, from here you get the ET tube out. It also has a mirror uh, uh, under it, which is not there in the photograph. So, uh, and uh, this is the uh, normal foam pillow. Now, specific uh, considerations when you are doing the pre anesthetic checkup of these patients, apart from the normal PAC that we do for any other patient, two important things. Uh, you have to do a comprehensive neurological examination. Not the signs of raised uh, ICP, uh, like uh, vomiting, headache. Uh, in patients who have come with SAH, you need to look for cardiac and pulmonary manifestations. Then uh, pulmonary evaluation, cardiac evaluation, uh, other comorbidities, as you do for any other uh, surgical patient. Few medications that these patients are usually on, they would be on activated drugs, they would be on steroids, which have to be continued until unless. Device specified. A comprehensive neurological examination, you need to check the mental status of the patient, GCS score, we all are aware. You can also use the AAP score. 
Uh, the motor system examines the power, reflexes, and gait. Sensory system examines the pain and touch. Cranial nerves, you have to be uh, careful about the lower cranial nerves. If the lower cranial nerves are involved, for example, it's a brainstem tumor or it is a cerebellofontaine angle tumor. If the cranial nerves are involved, then the diet will be compromised, the cup will be compromised, which will be an important consideration for you when you're planning your exit. And the cerebellar function has to be assessed in, by coordination and now, uh, now, each of these uh, slides that I'm going to present from here, each slide can be an individual chapter in itself. I'm only trying to uh, cover up the salient points here. First of all, the goals of your anesthesia across whether you're doing a cranial surgery or the spinal surgery, you have to maintain the perfusion pressure. the perfusion pressure and the spinal perfusion pressure. You have to maintain the systemic milieu of the body. The other important uh, uh, Consideration is to provide a slack or a relaxed pain to the patient. Employ neuroprotective strategies and facilitate early awakening because early neurological examination of the surgery. Starting with intracranial surgeries, uh, the normal general anesthetic management, I will be mentioning the uh, specific, uh, if there is any alteration to this technique as we go through the uh, slides now. But the normal general anesthetic management of these patients would be to induce the patient with opioid, methylfentanyl, preferably an IV anesthetic agent, propofol or thiopentone sodium, most commonly propofol. And for intubation, you are you use a non decolorizing mesothelioma. Such an is usually avoided unless you are uh, anticipating a difficulty. Wherein you can do such an but then because it causes a rising ICP, you have to employ other techniques to reduce the rising ICP. The next step after you have intubated the patient will be pin insertion. You have to be very attentive at this point because pin insertion, uh, the morphine pins ins uh, uh, induce a very strong uh, pain response and you need to supplement the depth of anesthesia and analgesia. Maintenance can be done either with inhalation technique or PIVA technique where you also use opioids and depending on your surgery and your neuromolecular requirements, you can use, you may or may not use non depolarizing muscle relaxants and let's see. Intraoperatively, maintain normocapnia, normoglycemia, normothermia, hematopic, and hemoglobin. Use isochronic fluids, a lot of controversy um, regarding the, whether you should use uh, normal saline or you should use balanced solid solution. But I think now the general consensus is we all use more of balanced solid solutions over plain NS. Then you have to employ anti edema measures. You have to administer anti epileptic drugs depending on the type of surgery you are doing and steroid. As required. Intraoperative brain birth, we'll look into it in detail in the coming slides. At emergence, when you're trying to extubate the patient, the important considerations will be the hemorrhage response. You do not want any hypertension because any hypertension will cause an increase in cerebral blood flow. And where the surgeon has stress and a hemostasis, there can be a brain in the pain. And the other important consideration is agitation. If the patient is agitated, you may not be able to evaluate the patient post operatively. And in the post op the first important considerations will be uh, analgesia, seizures, and postoperative muscle monitoring. Starting with supratentorial tumors, the most important considerations when you uh, look at these patients in the pre anesthetic checkup are look for signs of raised ICP, uh, any focal neurological deficits, any history of seizure. Is the patient on medications like steroids or diuretics, which have to be continued until unless specified? Look at the uh, size and location of tumor. Is it a vascular tumor? Is there blood vessel involvement? How much is the midline shift? How much is the surrounding edema so that you can decide upon the intraoperative, intraoperative anesthetic plan. Then decide about the patient position with the surgeon beforehand and also take into consideration the neuromonitoring techniques that they're going to require. Now, this uh, flow chart that is um, actually for a case of raised ICP, I have, introduced, I have included it here just to show that if there is intraoperative brain bulge, the, uh, the actions that you take are more or less the same. You have to give a head up pill for 15 to 30 degrees. You have to increase your sedation, your analgesia, maintain your CPT at 50 to 70 millimeters of mercury, maintain normothermia, and what you would normally be doing normocapnia, you can go mild hypertension. Then you can introduce osmotherapy, mannitol, or hypertonic saline. Again, a uh, lot of studies done for either agents, but uh, the most commonly used agent is mannitol, unless there is a contraindication to the use of mannitol. You need to increase your sedation further, and if even this does not suffice, then you can increase your propofol uh, dosage that you're giving. This decompressive option is uh, not applicable here. As I said, this is for a case of ICP that I've made this flowchart. 
uh, reach ICP. Okay? So, so even if this does not suffice, you can inform the surgeon. This is, uh, surgeon can drain some amount of space if it is possible. And uh, therapeutic hypothermia is usually not employed the appropriate degree for uh, controlling the Now, awake craniotomy. Uh, there are certain procedures for which the surgeon would want the patient to be awake uh, during the surgery. It is usually for tumors that are involving the eloquent areas of the brain. Uh, where uh, the patient's uh, motor cortex, sensory cortex, or language function, or the areas that are involved in language functions are lying close in close vicinity of the brain tumor. Or it could be for a patient of epilepsy surgery. So, very important to awake craniotomy, inform the patient preoperatively what is going to happen in the OT. Because the patient is going to be awake throughout the procedure, you have to tell him, uh, inform him about the surroundings of the OT, you have to tell him. That there could be noises uh, like uh, of a drilling of a machine when the surgeon is uh, opening the skull. Uh, you have to inform the patient about uh, all those monitoring techniques that we're going to do intraoperatively. And the anti epileptic drugs uh, and steroids have to be continued unless it is an epilepsy surgery where you need to have a discussion with the surgeon if the anti epileptics have to be continued or they have to be the Major anesthetic concerns because the patient is awake. But then you would be giving some amount of fentanyl, some amount of dexmedetomidin so that the patient can tolerate the procedure. So there is a risk of uh, losing the airway. You have to maintain adequate analgesia and ansiolysis. Now coming to ICP control can be a difficult thing in patients with awake craniotomy because you cannot increase your sedation, you cannot hyperventilate the patient. So you have a very limited options when you're trying to control ICP in awake patient. Then the other complications could be intraoperative seizures can happen, nausea, vomiting can happen. So we usually give uh, anti uh, prophylaxis. And because seizures can happen anytime in your surgical patient, the, uh, when you're starting the OT, you need to be prepared with ice cold cement. The moment there is a seizure, the surgeon sprays uh, 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 this ice cold cement on the area that is operating. Intraoperatively, you will. This is the duty of the anesthesiologist to continuously monitor the patient's motor symptoms, sensory symptoms, and language functions. Motor symptoms, you can keep telling the patient to lift your hand, lift your leg. You can talk to him about different things just to make out his language functions. And you can assess his uh, pain and temperature sensations for sensory mm -hmm. So because you can lose the airway at any time, obstructive apnea can happen. So always make sure that in case of an emergency, the airway is readily available. Uh, in a normal patient where the entire patient is great, in an awake craniotomy, we usually uh, keep the patient, the face of the patient open to us. Then there can be hypoxia, desaturation, seizures, and more. Now, the techniques for uh, awake craniotomy, uh, the, it can be done under complete local anesthesia, which is uh, known as scalp block, wherein we block these six nerves um, uh, that are uh, supplying the, the nervous supply of the of the head, skin. Uh, I'm not going into the details of scalp blocks, but uh, this has to be done on both the sides, even if you're operating on one side. Then you can use the technique of conscious sedation, wherein uh, you, along with scalp block, you can use some amount of propofol and lubricant. is a very good option, and always give oxygen supplementation. Or the other technique that you can use is asleep awake to sleep, wherein initially you in induce pain. Uh, you secure the airway once the patient you secure the airway uh, once the craniotomy is done the surgeon has reached the tumor you awaken the patient you remove the airway whatever you have used whether it is an ET tube or it is an LMA whatever you have used you will remove the airway this uh, you have to explain the patient beforehand when you go for the PSC that this is what is going to be done so that patient is not startled in the between of uh, surgery when he's awake now, after the dural opening, the patient is awake, awakened, airway is removed, and then once the cortical mapping is done, once the, you can again induce uh, GA uh, with or without airway instrument. Posterior facilitations in the PAC, you have to be uh, cautious about uh, features of raised ICP, gait changes for TIGO, cerebral symptoms, lower cranial nerve involvement, examination. If the patient is planned for a sitting surgery, uh, if the patient is planned for a sitting position surgery, you have to get an eco then to look for patient coming away because the risk of penis air embolism is very high. Presence, presence of a PFO would be a contraindication for sitting position surgery. Look for any associated conditions like one open and loss syndrome, which is commonly associated with cerebral axial 
say the tumor size, location, is there any brainstem compression? Discuss the patient position with the surgeon beforehand. It could be done in sitting position, it could be done in prone position, or sometimes nowadays even in extreme lateral position. And uh, discuss the neuromonitoring techniques that are going to be uh, used. Specific concerns uh, the, uh, regarding specific concerns according to the type of surgery that we're using. If it is a setting, with the, uh, if it is a position anything other than uh, supine, we might have to use reinforced uh, endocrine tubes because it will reduce the risk of pain. If it is a sitting position, you need to preload the patient adequately because the moment you take the patient in the sitting position, the BP calls passively. So, with around one liter of uh, crystalloid, preloading is usually done. In the sitting position, avoid nitrous oxide, avoid application of any P, and avoid manipulation because uh, nitrous oxide and P will increase your risk of cancer. Now, Minazide embolism itself is a uh, chapter. Uh, I'm not going to the details of it, but uh, what we commonly use uh, improperly is we use a transesophageal hypocardic T go, and you can actually make out hair on the uh, monitor. Epilepsy surgery in the PSC, uh, look for the type, time, and frequency of seizures, what antiepileptic drugs patient is on, which have to be continued or might have to be discontinued sometimes depending on the surgical requirements. Are there any associated conditions like tuberous sclerosis, neurofibromatosis? Uh, some of these anti-epileptics can cause coagulation and platelet arrangements to so look into them specifically and explain to the patient the risk of awareness. Intraoperative uh, concerns uh, in epilepsy surgery could be uh, the drug interactions between anti-epileptic drugs and anesthetic drugs because most of the anti-epileptic drugs are enzyme inducers, so the anesthetic requirements might be very high intraoperatively. Now, if they're planning to do a eco uh, uh, eco monitoring, <coughs> uh, electrocorticography monitoring intraoperatively, then again, it will have important implications on what anesthetic agency can use. Uh, again, you have to take into consideration that um, a lot of anesthetics can be pro conversion of them can be anti -conversion. So when you're doing an EPOB monitoring, you actually want to see the spikes, the seizure spikes or the uh, intractable spikes in the, uh, on the monitor. And then you have to You have to be very careful about the anesthetic agent that you're using. There are certain agents that you can actually give if you're not getting any spikes. Uh, for example, it uh, methohexacol, the in low doses can be given to act precipitate spikes. But then if the patient is uh, uh, already showing seizure activity, you might want to use agents that are not pro-convulsive. And the technique for epilepsy surgery can be awake anatomy or general anesthesia. Usually, epilepsy surgery, uh, certain procedures in epilepsy surgery like uh, hemispherotomy, corpus callosotomy, they but these patients are a little difficult to extubate in the immediate post op period. They usually come with delayed emergence, and the other complication is of perioperancy. Aneurysmal SH, another very important entity in uh, neurosurgery. Uh, in the PAC, look at the grading of SH. Different uh, grades are available. It could be uh, Hunter Nest classification, WFNS board, Fisher's board. You look at the type, size, and location of the aneurysm. Huge systemic manifestations of SH. It involves your nervous system. Apart from that, it involves your uh, cardiac system. It will show changes on the pulmonary system. There will be huge um, electrolyte disturbances. The patient can have seizures. The patient can have hydrocephalus. So all these things have to be kept in mind when you're evaluating a patient with SH. There could be certain associated conditions with SH. And the major complications, the life-threatening complication is the BP. Apart from that, a common post-operative complication is spaces hazard, and they can also have hydrogenous. So the anesthetic concerns primarily depend on what is the grade of the SH. If it is a good grade SH, the outcome is good. If it is a poor grade SH, as per your if it is a poor grade patient, then the outcome is usually poor. Then the uh, anesthetic concerns could depend on what um, uh, what intervention is being planned for these patients, whether it is surgical or it is endovascular. The goal should be to maintain hemodynamics. Do not uh, let any increase in ICP. Maintain CPP, neuroprotective strategies whenever needed or demanded by the surgeon. And the emergence, as I said, depends on the weight of the patient. When you're going for surgical, uh, surgically securing the aneurysm, the, the game changer in this has been temporary. 
This is a temporary clip, golden colored clip that is usually applied proximal to the aneurysm. So the surgeon is actually stopping the blood flow to the aneurysm for some time so that he can secure the aneurysm. And once the aneurysm is secure, the temporary clip is removed. <coughs> okay. So the major concern for us here would be what is the temporary clipping time? Usually up to 10 minutes is acceptable, but as the clipping time increases, uh, the uh, chances of neurological deficit in the postoperative phase increase. Now, when you are doing the temporary clipping, the surgeon might sometimes demand uh, neuroprotective strategies. So that is when uh, the role of EEG or birth suppression comes. So we usually uh, give supplemental doses of uh, uh, propofol or therapentol. We usually give uh, supplemental doses of uh, propofol or uh, therapentol to achieve an isolated the other important consideration is intraoperative rupture of aneurysm. It can even happen during your induction of anesthesia. It can happen uh, when the surgeon is operating. So intraoperative rupture can happen at any stage of the surgery. So that is why the induction, you have to be very careful about not causing an increase or a drastic decrease in blood pressure. And some surgeons also use uh, intraoperative uh, dye injection into cyanine green. Uh, this also is the responsibility of the anesthetist. So about this, you need to ask the operator face itself. Does the patient have any history of allergy to any of the contrast dyes? Appetitive tumors, uh, they could be a microadenoma, macroadenoma, functioning tumors, non-functioning tumors. These patients can be uh, hypothyroid. The, they, it could be a prolactinoma. It, could, it can present as, if it is a growth hormone secreting tumor, they can present with acromegaly. Wherein the airway can be very difficult, and Cushing's disease, diabetes, and so full endocrine workup and hormone replacements have to be looked into. Uh, and on the scan, see if there is involvement of cavernous sinus or peptides. Intraoperatively, if it is acromegaly, the airway can be difficult. After intubation, you need to put in a throat pack. Uh, the next important uh, stage is the nasal mucosa uh, infiltration with the uh, ADR containing local anesthetic that is done by the surgeon. Uh, so you need to look for changes on the uh, changes in the hemodynamics. Then to optimize surgical exposure, the surgeon might request you to slightly hypoventilate the patient so that the PACO2 rises around 35 to 40 millimeters of so that when the ICP uh, when the uh, PACO2 rises, uh, the cerebral blood flow rises the, and the pituitary tumor it comes down into the cella. So it becomes approachable for the surgeon to do. Okay, now this pituitary tumors are usually done by uh, endoscopic. Uh, 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 endoscopic uh, way, they go through the nose of the patient. It is uh, transnasal, transphenoidal. So, the patient, uh, surgeon is not opening the cranial cavity. Since they are going through the nose, they want the pituitary to come down so that they remove it from. Intraoperative injuries can be vascular injuries, sober aneurysm. Extubation in these patients should be very smooth. And in the postoperative phase, sometimes the nasal pattern is done. So you need to inform the patient beforehand that the nose will be closed. You need to breathe from the mouth in the post-operative. Post-operative complications, sodium disturbances because of diabetes and is very common. Hypopetriotism with uh, uh, all the hormone levels going down in the post-operative phase. They can be CSF leakage, meningitis. So coming to functional neurosurgery, uh, deep brain stimulation is a very uh, kind of unique procedure. It is also called as pacemaker of the brain wherein the surgeon inserts uh, stimulating electrodes into uh, different areas of the basal ganglion, depending on the indication. Most commonly done for patients of Parkinson's disease who are poorly controlled on treatment. So anesthetic concerns are usually Parkinson's disease patients. They will be of advanced age, they will have multiple comorbidities, multiple ongoing medications for Parkinson's disease. And because the patient is being planned for DPS, they, they would uh, very often be in an off drug state where most of the medications for Parkinson's disease have, are stopped. So that improperatively, the surgeon is able to get his microelectrode recordings because he needs to check the position of his electrode. Then there can be several drug interactions with Parkinsonism uh, uh, medications. Uh, again, uh, it is, uh, deep brain stimulation is usually done in an awake state using dexmedipromidin or fentanyl. But however, if the patient is not able to uh, in the, um, already the procedure in a way, so you might have to induce general anesthesia. Spine disorders. These are the common spine disorders uh, patients come with for neurosurgery. There could be several associated conditions. Down syndrome, Clippers Hill syndrome, echonoplasia, um, anal carry malformation. There could be rheumatoid arthritis, mm -hmm. ankylosing spondylitis, scoliosis. 
So in the PSA, if you discuss this is foliosis, you need to be careful about the pulmonary implications. You know, what is the level of the surgery? The cervical surgery, your outcome could be different. Uh, does the patient have any autonomic dysreflexia? Is the airway difficult? Usually with a cervical spine patient, even if the visible the airway is not difficult, you wouldn't want any movement of the cervical spine. So you might have to go in for an awake fiber optic technique, awake incubation as an unstable cervical spine. And then, because spine patients are very often uh, paraplegic or uh, paraparatic, there is a high risk of DVT and hypothyroid. Decide on the position of the surgery uh, beforehand uh, and keep, uh, pro provide good head support and keep the cervical spine neutral and again pressure point pattern. Aesthetic concerns, as I said, difficult airway. Depending on the neuromonitoring, if it is SSCP or MVP, you need to uh, change your technique according to that. Maintain the mean arterial pressure around normal. Extubation will depend on the type of surgery. If it is a cervical surgery, if it is a posterior fixation, you might not want to extubate the patient immediately. Uh, Postoperative care, you need to be careful about uh, uh, airway obstruction, pain, DVT prophylaxis, and postoperative visual loss is a complication of bone surgery. Now, intraoperatively, when the uh, monitoring for evoke potentials is going on, so, so suddenly the neurophysiologist says uh, the SSCP or the MEP responses are not coming. The first thing you need to do is inform the surgeon because when they're doing an instrumentation on the spine, there's a very high likelihood of the, the screw that they have used is directly compressing on the spinal cord. Because of which there is an injury to the spinal cord and that is where the potentials are lost. <clears throat> the first thing to inform the surgeon, then review your anesthetic drugs. Are you using any anesthetic drugs which are causing the increase in latency or a decrease in amplitude of the uh, potentials? Look at your oxygenation status. Increase your mean arterial pressure so that the uh, metro uh, is uh, retained. Correct any hypovolemia, correct any hypothermia. Check the patient uh, position. Look for any technical problems. Now coming to neuroradiology, you could be called into a neuroradiology suit for different procedures. It could be for an MRI, for a DSA, for endovascular coiling, for stroke interventions, or for a simple angioplasty. The issues with neuroradiology suit are that's a remote location. The BP targets could be different uh, depending on the patient that you are uh, encountering. But if it is a ischemic stroke, you need to keep your BP on the higher side. If it is a SAH, keep your BP on the lower side. If it is an angioplasty post securing an aneurysm, again, keep your BP on the higher side. Then there's a risk of radiation exposure. About mechanical thrombectomy, which is done for stroke, there's a lot of controversy. GA is better or local anesthesia is better. But the uh, bottom line is whether GA or local anesthesia, if you maintain your uh, systemic menu, the outcome does not change. Okay. Very briefly about MRI. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm crossing my time. Uh, about uh, the MRI, it is divided into four uh, safety zones. Zone one is freely accessible to general public. Zone two is the patient interviewing and screening area. Zone three is the restricted zone wherein your uh, MRI console is located. And zone four is actually where the MRI scanner is placed. This I'm showing here because nowadays intraoperative MRI uh, is also being done at a lot of centers wherein you have a single OT and at one end of the OT you have your MRI machine. Now the specific concerns in an MRI OT would be because the temperature of the MRI has to be maintained, the OT would be very cold. So you need to be very careful about maintaining your patient's body. The second important thing is all those devices that you have in the MRI OT have to be MRI compatible because uh, there is a very high uh, radio frequency field and a very high magnetic field, so projectile injuries are very common. And uh, other important things would be uh, whatever electrical wires that you have, please ensure that they are not looped multiple times because as the number of loops increases, the risk of heating and burns will increase. There can be anesthesia device malfunction if it is not MRI compatible device. Then for a patient who has a pacemaker or any other uh, implantable device, usually cardiac implantable devices, you need to get the interrogation and the programming done and also ask for any allergies because often you also need to give uh, blood aluminium contrast uh, for the intraoperative medicine. Specific concerns with endovascular coiling that is done for aneurysm surgeries, ask for proteinemia contrast uh, allergy. You need to have an activated protein time uh, testing system in the neuroradiology suite. Monitor the fluid balance very carefully because you might not have given much IV fluid, but uh, the uh, neuroradiologist because they're using an irrigation fluid, that the amount of that fluid given is very high. So we need to take that also into consideration. And intraoperatively, the aneurysm can rupture with the manifest as hemorrhage. 
So immediately you need to uh, reverse the current with protamines. You need to bring down the BP so that the blood loss reduces. Secure the leak with coils, and you need to control ICP by uh, hyperventilation using osmolar agents. Uh, briefly about neurotrauma. Uh, different uh, traumatic brain injury can be of different. Can be of different types. It can be an uh, EDH, SDH confusion, depressed skull fracture, diffuse axonal injury. It can be a traumatic SH or it could be an IH. Uh, the main uh, changes after a traumatic brain injury, the cerebral blood flow initially increases and then decreases. Autoregulation is impaired. Very important here because the autoregulation is impaired, so the blood flow to the brain is entirely dependent on the mean arteries because the brain is no more able to maintain. Uh, it's several blood flow because the uh, auto regulation is impaired. CO2 reactivity will be impaired. There could be cerebral vasospasm, which can cause hypoperfusion. The blood brain barrier might be disrupted, leading to uh, cerebral edema. Uh, glucose metabolism initially increases, then decreases, and the ICP is high. Now, how to uh, grade the severity of TBI? Commonly, when using the plasmacoma scale, uh, which uh, normal values are 15. Uh, anything less than eight uh, is uh, severe TBI. And uh, one of the uh, newer uh, scores uh, being used is the four score. The advantage four score has over GCS is that uh, the GCS does not take into consideration the brainstem reflexes of the patient and whether the patient is intubated or not. Here, what we do is uh, just for the verbal response, if the patient is intubated, we mark it as BP, which uh, might not be uh, good enough. So the four response, four score includes the eye response, the motile response, and apart from that, the brain stem reflexes. It takes into consideration your pupillary reflex, your corneal reflex, and your crop reflex, and also intubation, whether uh, the patient is intubated or not intubated, and um, does he have a spontaneous ventilation, uh, his brain efforts or not. The monitoring in DBI, I think we've already discussed all this. Uh, the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines for DBI, it says, uh, avoid uh, falling systolic blood pressure to less than 90 millimeters of mercury. Avoid PAO to less than 60 millimeters of mercury. Brain oxygenation has to be maintained. If you are using uh, jugular venous oximetry or PPTO2, uh, your SGVO2 should not fall less than 50%, PPTO2 not less than 15 millimeters of mercury. About the hyperoscular therapy, PTO uh, does not uh, favor either manitol or hypertensin, but manitol in a dose of 0.25 to 1 gram per kg can be Maintain the CPP, avoid CPP less than 50 millimeters of mercury, but at the same time also avoid aggressive attempts to increase the CPP to more than 70 millimeters of mercury because the fluid, the vasopressors that we give to maintain CPP more than 70 will cause injury to your pulmonary system and to your cardiac system. Initiate mechanical prophylaxis from the time of admission, and if there is no contraindication, you can as well initiate chemical uh, prophylaxis for DVD. Anesthetics and analgesics, uh, propofol and barbiturate can be used for refractory ICP. However, it is not routinely recommended for all patients with TBI. Anti seizure prophylaxis has been shown uh, not to reduce the incidence of late post traumatic seizures, but it can be used only for preventing the early post traumatic seizures for the first seven days after injury. Nutrition, initiate enteral feeds as early as possible. Initiate enteral feeds as early as possible and the full calorie requirements should be reaching by day seven. Specifically about avoiding, you need to avoid steroids, you need to avoid um, induced hypothermia. Now, what do you do when the, the, the STPN patients have a raised ICP? You first start off with non pharmacological measures uh, where you uh, hyperventilate, where you uh, give a head and elevation of 30 degrees. You can hyperventilate, but it is only a temporizing measure. Uh, probably in the, uh, helpful only in the uh, first six hours of the injury because after that hyperventilation will not help you much. And uh, the other problem with hyperventilation is that uh, with hyperventilation, because you're bringing your CO2 down, you are reducing the cerebral blood flow. So there could be an, uh, a risk of cerebral ischemia when the brain is already damaged, already traumatic injuries where the blood flow could already be reduced. And further you are giving hyperventilation, you're further reducing the blood flow to the brain. And nothing about hypothermia, but you have to prevent hyperthermia. Now, if these non pharmacological measure, measures are not suffice, when you're going for pharmacological measures, hyperosmolar agents, either manitol or hypertonic saline, start off with sedation, analgesia, paralysis if required. 
avoid steroids. And even this is not sufficing, then the last option is to do a decompensive kidney. Now, the few other things about general ICU management of patients with EBI, maintain hyponemia, avoid both hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia, periprocedural antibiotics as per your institutional protocol, uh, regular position changes to avoid uh, pressure ulcers, and stress ulcer prophylaxis. Coming to spinal cord injury, uh, it would be compression, flexion, extension, rotational injuries. It would be a stable spine and unstable spine. The systemic uh, complications, there could be hypertension, the, the rhythm abnormalities if it is a high cervical injury. In fact, even cardiac arrest can occur. Uh, atelectasis, pneumonia, respiratory failure is very common in, uh, high, in cervical and high thoracic uh, injuries. There could be uh, autonomic system involvement, manifesting as neurogenic shock. Temperature regulation could be impaired because below the level of injury, your blood vessels are not able to uh, vasodilate or vasoconstrict in accordance to the surrounding temperatures. The risk of DVT and pulmonary embolism is very high in these patients, and bubble and bladder involvement also could be there. So, uh, broadly about the management of spine injury, ABCD assessment, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. After that, ensure that the spine is immobilized. It has to be a hard backboard. A rigid cervical collar with lateral support devices to the head and the body of the patient, and then tape everything in place so that there is no movement at the cervical spine. Uh, Asia impairment uh, grading of severity of injury, neuroprotection in patients of spine injury. The role of neuroprotection is controversial. There have been a lot of studies where people have used methylprednisolone for different durations of time. However, nothing conclusive has come out so far. Uh, for the respiratory system, you need to do aggressive chest physiotherapy, assisted coughing and breathing exercises. Airway, preferably, if you need to secure the airway, use a uh, fiber optic intubation with cervical spine immobilization. And if you think that the patient is not going to come out of the ventilator anytime soon, then you decide to early get possible. Keep the mean arterial pressure more than 85 millimeters of mercury at least for seven days after spine injury. Uh, uh, ensure DVT prophylaxis. Urinary catheter might be needed, stress ulcer prophylaxis might be needed, enteral nutrition has to be started within 24 to 48 hours, and regular position change. So, in conclusion, neurosurgical patients, neurocritical care patients, maintaining systemic homeostasis is the key. Intensive neuromonitoring and timely interventions are essential. And continuity of care in the ICU after your patient is out of the OT is also equally important. Thank you, Varka. That was an excellent presentation. Thank um, you. Good evening, Satya sir. So, Virishan, um, sir, kindly your input, sir. Yeah, it's a fantastic and elaborative lecture, and it has given a very good uh, idea about the uh, Neuro anesthesia and the neurosurgical patient. So, how to deal? Um, I was attending almost all the seminars, but I, I never used to get a complete idea about it. But a, in short, it's a very, very elaborate lecture and more, more um, acceptable, more uh, valuable for the juniors and the young senior faculty. Thank you, Barka. Very good yes, presentation. You have covered almost all the uh, monitoring techniques and uh, ICP, everything you have covered. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Deepra, sir, uh, your input, sir. I think uh, Dr. Pawani is also there. Yes. Pavni many inputs, uh, Very excellent uh, lecture, Hello. Manu. And she yeah. has covered uh, from the basics. Uh, she has started from the anatomy. That was very impressive because even juniors uh, uh, will be able to correlate what exactly is the anatomy and physiology of neuroanesthesia. So very well covered. Excellent uh, job. Hello. Impressive, sir. Your inputs, sir. Yeah. It was very nice presentation, Dr. Barkha. But uh, 
recently i have not been in any neurosurgery practice i have been out of this new how often is the intracranial monitoring being performed nowadays uh, probably in the neurosurgery units only uh, specialized uh, uh, hospitals only i think uh, icit monitoring is done intraoperative we used to see only bulging of the brain as a parameter and then we used to go for hyperventilation and all those head up positions and uh, protection is it commonly used uh, intracranial catheters for this uh no sir in the ot icit monitoring is not very commonly used uh, but it is even in the um, uh, neuro icu a lot of centers are uh, nowadays not uh, using those invasive uh, icit devices okay. though at some places that are still using those cordman catheter usually it is i think it is more yeah. useful in icu only yes If it is craniotomy is there there is a, we will see it no? so also yeah. how is the brain is bulging most of the time it is when the cranium is not open these are the better monitors probably yeah yeah and post operatively also how it is progressing of the icp very icp but very very crucial probably and we are not aware of it and we have not seen also yeah we have not seen we have not seen all those gadgets for uh, yeah. monitoring the icp intraoperatively we used to just empirically do it with the seeing of the surgical field thank you yes, for thank you for the next presentation thank you sir baka have a question you said uh, most of the analgesics are epileptogenic so what is the best uh, analgesic management in these patients we are commonly using the fentanyl so it is uh, uh, epileptogenic but it is the best for us Then you are going at fentanyl. Uh, Remifentanil is good or uh, fentanyl is good? So Remifentanil is the best option, but because it is not available, we are using fentanyl. Okay, and one more question. We normally see that uh, you also must have seen during your PG time when you say the BP is high. Most of the time, the surgeons give one or two drops of Depin, bring the BP to normal, and get the patient back to you. So we know the cardiac side effects of it. of sudden fall in the blood pressure are there any cns side effects with that sudden fall in uh, blood pressure uh, sudden fall in blood pressure because of anesthesia no no uh, depin or whatever they give to reduce the bp preoperatively okay. preoperatively okay uh, yes ma'am as i was uh, talking about the auto regulation curve if you uh, it is always best to have a properly optimized patient for surgery because if the patient is not a controlled hypertensive immediately before surgery you have just try to control the bp for say uh, one or two days the auto regulation curve has to not come to the normal range what it would be for a normal individual so uh, accordingly the cerebral blood flow can be compromised if you the patient is not properly controlled hypertensive you might be assuming uh, that yeah, the bp is normal so you will try to maintain your target blood pressure as you do for any other normal individual but because the auto regulation curve is still not uh, in the normal uh, range for this patient your uh, the decrease in blood pressure that has occurred might actually be harmful to this patient. is the best uh, monitor what is the clinical monitors we will use for the patient is going to have multiple brain insults stroke injury uh, after the surgery like that how do you assess uh traumatic brain injury sir yes with multiple intracranial injuries yes okay and the best clinical monitors yes uh sir so, uh, whatever the what whatever you usually you do it how the patient is going to survive after surgery Uh, in trauma so uh, uh, among the icp monitoring devices we normally use the uh, device is the cordman catheter but then it is entirely the surgeon's call if they feel it is needed only then they would insert uh, uh, a lot of centers they don't use invasive icp monitoring anymore but yes if it is there then that is the best guide uh, about the uh, icp status of the patient Uh, you will get an idea about how much depression you are maintaining, what is the CPP targeting, 
If you have a nice economy, it's it that's the best thing. But if you do not have that, apart from that, you, but as I said, you can use your liberal um, oxygen uh, monitoring techniques. NIRS is uh, commonly available nowadays. You can uh, uh, also do uh, PCD monitoring. That will also give you an idea about the circuit. But yes, if all these uh, sophisticated tools are not available, it is only clinical monitoring that you can do. Then hourly assessments of uh, GCS. Uh, hourly assessment of uh, pupils, these are the most important things. The moment there is an isochoria, the moment there is a fall in GCS, well. Uh, sir, we don't have any questions in the chat box. Sir. Uh, and I think uh, it's an elaborate lecture. We have crossed more than one hour also. I think this yes. will be accepted is like that. Both surgery and the teaching uh, also will be like that. So then, <laughs> and then yes. uh, we conclude. Wow, what do you say, sir? You press it, sir? Yeah, we can conclude now. It was a nice okay. lecture. Yeah. I think you uh, must be waiting for the Apollo conference, TSCon, for some yes. lecture uh, on neurosurgery. You kindly select and send. Uh, we will try to right. listen in uh, your lecture in our uh, Telangana conference in Apollo. State TSCon. conference. Yeah, yeah. State conference. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Berger. Uh, it is in the month of uh, July, uh, yes. late 9 10. You may get some, we will talk with the scientific committee of this ISA TS call. So then you may get the call or you may get to be free on, on those days. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Barka. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barka. Thank you. 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 Thank